You can sit over there if you like. You can sit over here. You can sit over there. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Buckman. I will be uh, your host for the evening. And I would like to uh, talk about the picture. Right, we can all remain seated. Okay. So welcome to the territory of the Mustang, Squamish, and the Sailor Station. And we do it on various locations in that humor. If you're not familiar with our location, uh, Muscreen is out towards uh, UBC. Thomas is just across the second arrows, and the Slammer Tooth is on the other side of the second arrows bridge. Very small reserve. Muscreen and Thomas are very large. They have about maybe four or five thousand members. And we only have just under 1,500. And I work for SFU. I've been working for SFU for a number of years. And I do the openings and the events for the. I do the openings for events and ceremonies. And um, it's been really exciting because I get to go out to meet a lot of different people from different places and different interests. So I'll just say a quick prayer and uh, get sure you can go in. I'm sorry, I can't stay with you this evening because I'm, I'm on a deadline to get some arts and crafts finished for this play. <laughs> <laughs> and we meet tonight <laughs> at 6 o'clock. But great spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Just guide each and every one of us on our path that we are on. Thanking our communities from where we come from and our families for allowing us to do the work that we do. And letting us always remember that we are the leaders and the mentors of those who follow us, those who witness what we do and what we say. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on each and every one of you here today that you enjoy our beautiful British Columbia and beautiful Vancouver. Great Spirit, just touch each and every one here tonight in all our relations. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to see everybody here. For those of you who we are translating this whole evening, so it feels uh, free to speak in English or uh, Francais. The headphones are up at the the headphones are up at the front there. If you need them, please. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> No one's going to get it on each So, <laughs> to continue, today this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Kinsmia, and U.S. peoples, and acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to the land where we learn to work. As my colleague Ryan Kirkby at University of Health likes to say, it also reminds us of that power matters. Knowing who has it and how it is wielded is not a theoretical exercise we engage with when we have time. Rather, identifying, analyzing, and challenging power in respect or varying manifestations, both negative and positive, is a responsibility we have as educators and as library members. And this meeting is an appropriate time to pause and reflect on this obligation. What we would, the organizing team would like you to think about and reflect on while you're meeting with us over these two days is how inclusive our open access model and what inequities do open systems recreate or reinforce whose voices are prioritized, whose are excluded, and what are areas where openness might not be appropriate. This event would not have been possible without our tremendous partners. So I just want to thank them right away. You see logos, but you don't see logos because my head. You see logos. But there's some folks in the room. Alors, c'est un événement qui n'est pas possible sans l'aide de nos partenaires. Alors, un grand merci à... And I'm going to make you stand up because we're just right here. Susan Hay from Carl. Thank you. Is Claire here from Sandy? There's Claire. Thank you, Claire. Nick Shockey from Spark. 
Thank you. And there are sponsorships too, the University of Alberta, the University of, well, Dalhousie, Mount St. Vincent University, University of Ottawa, and University of Saskatchewan all chipped in to make sure that registration is covered for everybody. So I think a big round of applause for everybody. Thank you. This room set up will work very well soon, but I go over there because of the line that I can't cross. I also want to thank the members of the Car Carl's Open Repositories Working Group. There's a number of them in this room. Uh, some folks who aren't here, Martha Whitehead, Jeff Carter, and Talia Chunk, who were chairs of the ORWG. They were very supportive of this from the start. And then some members of the group that are in the room. So when I see your name, please stand up. Is any of you? Yeah, Tomas, Dan, Kathy's here, and is Arlene right here? Hi, Arlene! <laughs> Thank you all for the work that you've done. So if you have any questions about what the ORWG is working on these days, next gen repositories, open air, IR usage data, various community building things, give a shout to those people. Uh, a number of you also agreed to participate as mentors for this event. If you are here, could you stand up and give a round of applause? Yay, come on! Yay! Yay! Thank you so much! As someone who's been a uh, part of Small Online for quite a while now, it is amazing to see the friendship all starting up, and I really I hope it continues because we definitely need that. Finally, and I want to thank this is my biggest thanks. Everybody is awesome, but this is my biggest thanks. My biggest thanks is to everyone who is participating here. You took the time. Some of you are at the PKD sprint this morning and your brains are mush. Sorry, it's not going to get my Yikes. And you came from other, from faraway places today, so I really want to thank you all for participating. Leah and I were just talking that in the 12 years that we've been a part of Small Homeland in Canada, we have not, never heard of a meeting where a bunch of practitioners are getting together to actually talk about these issues face to face. And so we're really thrilled that you are all here. Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Okay. All the blues on this floor are gender neutral. Uh, tomorrow we are on the third floor and the fourth floor, and the gender neutral blue is on the second floor. So you're going to get your steps in. We have a code of conduct, which we expect that everyone has had a read of. Uh, please review it if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. You can also speak to the following people, and I'll ask them to stand as well. Nick Shockey, please grin. He's just ran upstairs and send your watch. So any concerns with the code of conduct, you can find them, and there's more information on the website. Uh, tomorrow, there will be no translation for the breakout sessions, but we will have translation again for the plenary. So if there's any concerns, those of you who speak English and French, please help our colleagues out if there's any concerns with uh, language or semantics or all those types of things. We want to make this uh, as friendly as possible for everyone. As I mentioned in the opening, many of the conversations we're going to have during this meeting are about identifying, analyzing, and challenging power. And part of the reason that we wanted to get everybody together to talk about all these things is that we're kind of in the weird moment in library land where we've ceded a lot of power to publishers and we throw up our hands saying, like, oh, we can't do other things, it's all really hard. And at the same time, we're actively replicating the traditional hierarchies of power that we find in the academy. So we, we are just replicating, we're going online and replicating all the same things that print world brought us. And so I hope we talk a lot about that. I want you to look around the room. And though the organizing committee tried to make access as equitable as possible, we had travel bursary make sure there's a registration. We're certainly not as diverse of a group as we had hoped to be. And just in case you don't believe me, we're good library managers and we have some data. So I have some slides for them. And we broke down those questions on the registration form for a reason. And I'm just gonna flip through them. We're not gonna do any commentary, but just so that we're all aware of like who's in the room and more importantly, who's not in this room. Who should be here that is not here? What's that related to? Type of institution? Do you identify as an indigenous? Do you identify as 2SLGGQIA? 
and racially visible. So just something to keep in mind as we move forward with these conversations, those questions that we were asking at the beginning, who's not in this room, when is open not necessarily the right way, are we just replicating various power needs in new ways? Let's just keep all those things in mind as we move forward. And my final bit of housekeeping before we get going. Will the following people please stand? It's going to take pictures. Just so you know. Leah Matriot and Eric. Nancy McCallum. Nick Shaka. <laughs> Come stand over here. Rebecca Ross. And these who's upstairs, who is truly awesome. Everybody with an orange tag is your organizing committee. Any questions, comments, concerns at all, just find one of us and we'll help you out because we definitely want this to be an awesome event. Everybody ready? <laughs> 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 Let me introduce our keynote. <laughs> Juan Pablo Azarin is an assistant professor at the School of Publishing at SFU. Who knows Juan Pablo already from Twitter, from various conferences, from OpenCon? Yeah. And he's also co-director of the Scholarly Communications Lab. He does have stickers on the pillow. He's a multidisciplinary scholar with training in computer science from Waterloo, social science also from Waterloo, and a PhD in education from Stanford. He believes that research, especially when it is made freely available, has the potential to make meaningful and direct contributions to society. He has contributed a combination of conceptual, methodological, and empirical peer reviewed articles and presentations in leading journals and conferences, and has edited two volumes on two volumes on scholarly communication topics. Ooh, so awesome you're here. Big welcome for our publicity. Reminded me of uh, the very first time I came to Vancouver was for the first PKD conference back in 2007 when I was, uh, you know, I just sort of flown up from uh, Argentina to come via this thing and then you know, I meet John Olinsky standing in the middle of that really like, like now in this room. I just kind of showed up straight for that thing and there was, uh, and then he gives this talk holding up a little piece of like a booklet about this side. Something I picked up from him is taking all of your conference speaking notes in the tiniest piece of the paper possible. And I thought I was going to be replicating that experience tonight, and I'm glad that we are seeing the smaller version of that big <laughs> round. Uh, and so, not following in John's uh, lead, when you uh, have to speak uh, or hear to speak, he also never used his time. Uh, but I actually decided that I want to talk and share with you some of the results of some research that we've been doing at the lab. Like, uh, looking at the questions and the themes that you're going to be discussing over the next few days uh, would sort of help to present perhaps a slightly different view of uh, or a different perspective thinking around the role that uh, faculty like myself have in thinking about these issues of So there will be quite a few sort of some slides and some graphs, so I'm suggesting that the folks that have their back to the screen might want to at least not, you know, have to strain your neck, unless you like to strain your neck and you to strengthen the muscles on just one side. Uh, but otherwise, I think we could try to, uh, you might want to get a little more comfortable feel to it. I'll try to remember to spin around as often as possible so that I can make time to make it. So I want to start off by uh, sort of saying, like, yeah, I want to ask sort of this basic question. I want to try to get at some data. We've been doing some research projects, a research project around the new kind of motion. And it is because we hear that conversation around why we're not advancing open and that people always put faculty at the center of the question around, like, it's the faculty that are somehow not making decisions. And we've talked about, I think, that all of you that advocate and have thinking, and I think probably everyone in this room has in somehow some views that are somewhat supportive of open access, have used one of these or many more arguments. And we've seen why we should have a way, we should be justified, well, you know, that we get a citation advantage, so that we can appeal to their desire to succeed by telling the, the faculty members that they will get more citations. Or that it's just the right thing to do, right? There's an ethical imperative to be sharing an open access. 
or there's a cereals crisis and we can't afford all the journals, we need to change the business model, so there's an economic necessity to change the model of publishing. Uh, we have responsibility to the taxpayer that funds the work, and we've heard this puts around like sort of saying, you know, the public has a right to that, it's the most pay for. Or imperative around improving, like accelerating science, right? It's about speeding up science and making sure that we're advancing knowledge as quickly as possible. Or issues around it's like sort of bridging like knowledge divide and helping to give access to people that wouldn't otherwise have access. Not and this was uh, traditionally framed for around issues of like global well, south and global north, but really just about issues of like right, inequity of access to knowledge. And of course more. So you've heard all of these kind of arguments, right? And this is like back going back into like my early work thing when I was doing my work with Latin America for my dissertation, where we I sort of studied journal cores in Latin America, and we're trying to look at who had access to uh, who was actually downloading the research. Very simple research design, getting a journal portal, asking a pop-up question, asking people, why are you interested in this article? Right? Or where do you work? And you start to ask people and you get these. Right? And when we ask people, it just did, you know, 75% for academic reasons, but the other sort of are it's somewhere between, depending on the question and the portal, you know, a good 20, 25% of people were asking for not academic reasons. We're asking people where they work, so you get, you know, half of them are faculty, or work, uh, sorry, half of them are students, a quarter were coming from universities, and the other quarter, again, non academic. So we have, and this is sort of just to show an example, but we have some evidence of the public was kind of accessing these non-academic And they just didn't, all of a sudden, although we often talk about, you know, the, the emblematic case for open access and the public's access to research, like health always comes up first because we always think it's very, it's a very easy case to make, like patients should have access to research about whatever is, uh, whatever medical health concern they have. We want their doctors to have access, like here's like, you know, people that are trained, professionals that can read very complicated things, we want them to have access. That's a very obvious case. But in the work that I did back for the, the Journal for Latin America, actually finding that public access sort of spans all the disciplines. We would find that the social science, the arts and humanities research, you get slightly different breakdowns of how much is for personal use or for professional use, depending on the discipline. But we found that that sort of 20%, 15, 20, 25%, again, depending on the question, depending on the discipline, would vary, but it would still be there of the non academic. Which is all just more part of building the case for why open access matters. Right? And yet, we're still not there, right? When we look at the actual proportion, yeah, the proportion of research, the amount, because everything is growing, everything is increasing, but even the proportion of research that's OA, here for the, we did with Ed Brewer and Jason Creep, who went back story using their on paywall data, right? And another colleague, the proportion is going up. But even if we consider what we dubbed as bronze OA in that in that paper, uh, which is the stuff that is publicly available, but the licensing is not clear and the status is not clear, even if we count using, and this is counting also as much of the repository that we open access, even in the broadest and biggest categorization of open access, we're still at all the in the most recent stuff that's the, that we were uh, that we looked at in the study from 2015, was still only 45% of the literature. Right? So, we have tons of great arguments for having a way. Right? We can attack it from every angle. We have some evidence, and there's some other sort of studies and things that we could cite the public and people that make access, make use of the open access uh, research. Yet, we don't like it. And so, I asked the question around, like, so why not? Why is it that we can't actually get there in terms of making 100% full, full away? We have evidence that the public values of research that's been publicly available, and I argue that we should be valuing, like, actually making that. So this is a question now, which is why we ask faculty members all the time: right? Should we are we actually valuing this work? And I think, like, you know, do, do we do that? I think if we did, all of these conversations around open access wouldn't keep coming around to this issue of consent. It's part of the reason that led us to do this study around. Found that all of the conversations have just keep coming back to, well, people are just not rewarded for making their research. Like even though we have all of these great reasons, like we're still not actually valuing it in faculty members, uh, like uh, what we expect from faculty members. 
And so we started sort of first looking and for evidence of the fact that yes, incentives get to blame for like incentives is the reason always given for why we don't have access. And so we started sort of digging around in the literature and we started finding and just like things in writing, uh, uh, sort of you know from ministers of, of science, uh, G7 uh, sort of science uh, meeting that happened in 2017, that they agreed that an international approach can help this, uh, can help the speed and coherence of this transition towards open science, and that it should target a particular two aspects. First, among them, the incentives for openness in the research ecosystem, and the evaluation of research careers should better recognize and reward open science. Uh, Minister of Science talking about we could just change the incentives to solve this problem. Provost to universities. This is just a, it was a piece published uh, in uh, by um, again provost got together over making recommendations and offering specific suggestions that faculty members could use while we move academic publishing. Again, one of those recommendations ensuring that the promotion and tenure review are flexible enough to recognize and reward new modes of uh, communicating research outcomes. Get among those open activities and different forms of scholarship and friends from other forms of scholarship. And when we ask faculty members themselves, so this is just a pretty sort of key, uh, uh, key study that was done a little bit dated now, but it was back from 2010, but it was part of a large project looking at uh, assessment in academia uh, done at, uh, by some scholars in Berkeley, and where they know that there were calls however, for a more nuanced academic reward system less depending on citation meditation, slavish adherence to marquee journals and university presses, and the growing tendency of institutions to outsource assessment and scholarship to such <coughs> So we're hearing calls for looking at incentives. So we as a as a sort of as researchers and the, the, with, with the team were like, okay, we're going to study this thing. Okay. So what do we actually know about incentives and what's actually happening? So there's tons of research done around our key, but we still there's a lot of areas that we still didn't know too much. We collected, and this is so part of a study founded by the Study Foundation that started a couple of years ago. We collected sort of hundreds of documents about review tenure promotion from 129 universities. We did a stratified sample to make sure we had a representative set of universities from the different research tiers, uh, 381 academic units within those universities uh, from, uh, from both the US and Canada. In fact, in Canada, we have all of the, we basically have all of the Small enough that we could include them in the US and we had around. And we had units from all of them. I don't really want to, I mean, we could get into all of these details around the numbers, but I want to give you a sense of it's a pretty unique data set and that it's a representative set of universities that we were choosing from. And we were able to collect quite a few documents from across disciplines, from across institution types, and we were able to start doing these. And I'm going to come back to why all of this is so important for us to, uh, as we were sort of looking at these documents. Because these are now the documents that guide the career advancement of faculty members. And if none of those good reasons that we have for making things open access are enough, then, and this is the one thing that's going to be holding us back, it's like when we can split faculty and say, well, people are going to go ahead in their careers, then we're going to finally achieve this goal of full open access. So we started looking at what these documents say. And we think that this is probably one of the, the best. We, we, at the beginning of the first year of the project, this was actually all we really had planned was to look at what's inside of these documents and try to understand. We thought that these documents would sort of be the, um, the closest thing to a ground truth that we could have around what's actually rewarded in that event. And so what we find is that when we looked at this, this is something we came up with, we published it last fall as a preprint and then published earlier, um, uh, earlier this year. Uh, kind of came up. Uh, when we looked at what words are contained in these documents, what we find is, especially at the research institutions, that's the top line of each of these bars, uh, is that the word impact gets talked a lot, uh, quite a bit around these things. The concept of metrics gets talked a lot, again, a lot more at the research institutions. Uh, traditional outputs, and here we're just counting uh, sort of journal articles, uh, books. Chapters, conference presentations, conference proceedings, those kind of things. Talked about at almost every single institution. Actually, we tried to slice that in whatever, across disciplines, across institution types, across institution subtypes, and it's just 90 to 95 percent across all those things. That was get talked about everywhere. And the term open access, that's the one that you almost can't see the bars. <laughs> okay. uh, not really talked about these documents. 
feeding into this narrative that, okay, with these open access is actually not valuable. What we value is impact, what we value is traditional research, research elements. This is just broken down now by, by disciplines, right? So you can just kind of see the variation. You see that there is, um, this is across, I started only looking at the research intensive institutions. And you can see that there is some variation uh, between, uh, in some of these terms, around where these things get mentioned, but uh, you still see the traditional outputs sort of still up at, at around 90% mark. Um, and open access is actually the few instances that we had there were only present in the social science. Okay. Uh, so those of you that work with the social sciences or have sort of an affinity or love with the social sciences, let me show you what these mentioned open access actually work. Okay? So let's dig further into open access. How is open access popular? So you're like, okay, it might only be six percent of institutions, but at least it's six percent of institutions. Okay? So some of the mentions. Some are negative. Unfortunately, it's not possible for candidates to receive negative evaluations at lower levels, department, uh, you know. To compensate for these negative evaluations by using online journals which feature instant publishing of articles of questionable quality for a These journals have been described as predatory open access journals. Okay, so great. Open access <laughs> about it in the you said you wanted to talk about it in the your promotion. There it is. Uh, we had other mentions a little more cautious. In a related issue, as technology advances and the fields expand, publications and less traditional venues are becoming more common. This includes open, online and open access venues, blogs, and other types of non-traditional publications. So again, equating open access as uh, you know on the same sort of level as the purpose being non-traditional, uh, and also being creating a sort of in the same place as blogs and other types of non-traditional publications. Both signaling a concern about open access and a deep misunderstanding of what open access. And then we found, and this is like, a, a, I gotta say that I'm really glad that we ended up with UNC Chapel in our sample because there's like all of the positive things that we found in these guidelines. Like, they have an example of all of them. They're probably the most progressive and at least most aligned with my own personal values. This is one of these where you have, and this is a shout out to the librarians, uh, sort of saying that in the guidelines of uh, health science, that they sort of in the guidelines of which unit says like the UNC Chapel Hill Health Sciences Library maintains a website promoting open access. So this is like pointed at in the document to say here the library says here it has some resources available for you to look at. So it's not actually actively valued or encouraged, but at least they're saying the same way you work. So we do find some positive. And we can get into and I probably don't want to sort of take too much time going into all of the different uh, examples. So those are university level guidelines. And when we get into the academic unit level guidelines, we're talking about departments or faculty, we find some, again, the same kind of negative talking around uh, the, the, the equation of open access or the warnings against predatory open access journals. Uh, if you're strongly cautioned against publishing in journals that are widely considered to be predatory open access journals, listed in there, uh, and say with self published, inadequately referee open access writing. And online publications will be scrutinized carefully and they be giving little to no stature of evidence. Okay, so there is work to be done in these results. Some cautious mentions again, that just sort of say, and I just don't want to read them all out, but sort of say some cautious mentions that you can see around basically these four will. If this open access, we'll have to look at them a little bit more carefully. Uh, and then the more neutral mentions, and this is probably like the closest thing beyond the link to the other ones that I showed you earlier. Open access peer reviewed publications are valued like all other peer reviewed publications. So when we call for open access to be talked about in peer tenure promotion, we should probably keep in mind uh, that we should be very specific about what exactly we want them to say and think. Because if we just want more of the same talking about open access, before, before, before. Um, okay. I want to dig into another aspect of this. So this is what for us was so kind of fascinating about looking at it. We really thought, and this, a lot of this was sort of spark, and this is a, the, the, there's going to be a couple of shadows of spark, but let me see the first one now. Uh, a lot of times, this project was sort of inspired, first it was at a spark meeting that we were at, and we sort of came up with the idea of this project. It's inspired by a desire to do like a change the form kind of a so when we started looking at and thinking, okay, well, we should really try to promote change in the, the, the structure. What we 
started looking at these documents and started to find that they they do a couple of things that are quite interesting. One is like we find some surprising things that we can just look at just by counting dimensions, right? And see what gets attention in the document. But then we wanted to start digging to a little bit further. Okay, how does this get operationalized in practice? And the fact that metrics were talked about in, in, in these documents uh, it led us to sort of want to figure out is there at least metrics talked about in some way that we could get a leverage towards trying to get more more interesting in practice or different kinds of publications. So if we want to get into the metrics one a little bit further, which again is three quarters of the research intensive universities, so which is for the highest ones of the most publications. We started to look into those a little bit further and we, we decided, okay, well let's tackle the other sort of boogeyman in the, the South Com world, right? The journal impact factor, and seeing if this would be a place where we could sort of get a better understanding of how are these things being used. So we grabbed the terms and we sort of started digging into from that metrics of 75% where we could just dig into trying to understand a little bit more what it is that uh, how people talk about impact factor. So first we grab the words that are really very much directly to it, like directly top uh, impact factor, impact factor, impact score, impact metric, uh, impact index, which again is this sort of like side lesson that we learn is the degree of uh, the, the lack of knowledge and understanding of all these things that in our world of people doing scholarly communication, like we know what the impact factor actually is, and you see that it gets talked about, I mean, like, you know, the impact score, the impact index, like, it's not actually an actually a thing, it's like, that it becomes a thing when it gets associated with the impact factor. So we consider that first round terms to be very explicit mentions of the impact factor, even though they weren't calling it as it. And then we took the second ring, which is the other words that are probably quite associated with the impact factor, but that might not be repeated. Uh, but that we thought, is there still reference to the impact factor? So when they talk about high impact journals, right, or the impact of the journal, or the journal's impact, that these are sort of coded words for the impact factor. And then there was a bunch of words that we didn't, were like, okay, these are feeling less similar to talking about the impact factor, so we should be careful, so we didn't want to count them. But we noted that they're there. We kind of made a list of some of these other ways that people more indirectly and subtly strategies to sort of refer to these things like the top tier journal, like high ranking journal, high quality, leading journal. Which are sort of coded word for journals with high impact factor, but we still felt like, well, maybe they don't mean the actual impact factor, so we shouldn't do it now. So in what I'll present in the next couple of slides, we'll just be looking at these uh, sort of central, the, the two winners. Okay. First of all, unsurprising when you saw that 75% of the uh, RS mentioned mention uh, metrics, that it's also the impact factor itself, just those two inner circles get talked about that. So at the archive institutions, 40% of them mention some one of those words for the impact. The impact factor is very much sort of included. Uh, and it's overall, it's our sample sort of really better to look sort of at the by institution type, so none of the baccalaureate type institutions talking about it. It's sort of unsurprising because institutions are not necessarily focused on research publications. And then when we see, again, using the same kind of uh, thinking about cautious, neutral, or supportive words that they're hoping to find the supportive words for open access, and we did, but we did find lots of supportive uses of the word, of the term impact factor when they talk about what is it actually measuring. Finding that in the archive institution, sorry, in the archive institution, 83% of those mentions of the impact factor were doing so in a very you know, supportive way. Because here, maybe we would have found the same thing, that they were sort of, say it was open access with like a warning. Maybe when they're talking about the journal impact factor, they were saying, don't use the journal impact factor. In fact, that was only the case in, uh, in uh, well, outright negative, there was no instances, so there was sort of like just the caution. That 13% of the archives had at least were a mention that sort of warned against it. Actually, mostly warnings against comparing between disciplines, but not warnings against it. None of them outright said do not use okay. And when you ask them what is it that they're measuring, the impact factor measuring it being a measure of quality in the vast majority of instances. So again, uh, it's about so 87% of all the mentions in our sample. Your back factor is a measure of quality uh, in other instances. So much less than we need. 
measuring things like uh, prestige or impact of the journal, like really relevant fact that you're going to use one. Too many things to hold. Um, okay, so I mean, the associations with quality, I'm probably actually just going to skip through some of these, but just to give you the sense. I just want to give you a sense of sort of a little bit what these documents are sort of helping us to, to understand. Because this is sort of, like, again, this is the place where we're trying to understand what it is that in fact we are being fed by. And these are the things that are written into these documents. It's important to remember as we start thinking about the role of faculty is that faculty are the same people that wrote these documents in the first place. Okay? And so, it, in some sense, they're capturing this like this misunderstanding of what it is that I mean, that's going on inside of that. Uh, this is a little bit some of the things that I want to I, I want to sort of highlight and go through this is that these misunderstandings, this conception that are sort of feeding into the narrative around the journal impact factor being like the measure of quality around open access is not getting thought about. These are all things that are in some sense capturing this and uh, the perception of the world that, that academics is in. Uh, so, again, just some quotes here just so you can not see the way that this gets talked about. So, measures of reach and impact, again, measures of quality. Um, yeah, so, who writes this stuff, right? Because like, you kind of look at it and it can be a little like some of the phrasing. Let me just say, we actually were looking at one of the, one of the qualitative uh, analysts in, in the lab, Michelle Lash. She started to actually look at the rhetorical strategies used in these documents that were actually going to just try to do like a little. Um, noting, like trying to classify some of the like, some of the different rhetorical strategies that are used in these documents, because I have to say, to give us credit for that, I think some of them are pretty masterful. Right? <laughs> the ability of encapsulating absolutely everything, making absolutely anything possible, but also making it possible like, while at the same time sort of being like just specific enough that you feel like there's some guidance there, but also vague enough that you can include or exclude anybody. So you can give tenure to anybody that you want because the U.S. Right, it's like it's a, uh, a successful industrial world typically. So just adding that word typically, but it means like, well, I didn't do those things, but I'm not typically. <laughs> <laughs> or we have the opposite, where it's just like, well, I did all those things, and then they don't want to give it to you. They don't want to give it. To you. It's like, yes, you did those things, but also you're not you're not typical. <laughs> so it's like, there, and there's all of these other things like list that they are. This is either inclusive nor exclusive. It's like another like, sort of key phrase that you get in these things. So it's just like, yeah, it could be those things, but also it could be anything else. Like, so it's, just, it's so we're working on that one. This is like probably we're looking sometime later in the year before we actually get that done. Uh, but uh, this, these documents are really a master class in uh, the, the right level of thing. <laughs> okay, so then we got to the, so this is, uh, that's the wrap up on the documents part of the study, which we thought was going to be where we were going to end it. And then we kind of realized there's only so much that we can actually learn about looking at these documents. Because of these, because of that vague language that we use in these documents, that anything is allowed. We actually found that the words of sort of public and publicness and engaging with the public, all those things actually do get mentioned in these documents. And then there's something else going on around them providing lots of specifics around things like the impact factor and telling you how you should use it or, or what it measures. And so there is something going on there that is the split between what the documents say and allow, which they do allow for open access and they do allow for engagement with the public, while at the same time tapping into something that's part of the greater culture, which is sort of signaling in a more subtle way that certain practices are more acceptable than others, or certain measures are more valuable than others. And so we did sort of a second part of this. We sort of went back to the Human Society Foundation and said, you know, we're learning lots from the documents, but we actually need to ask that as a question. So we did this thing where we grabbed all of the doc all of the institutions for which we had academic level unit documents, and then we went and asked and surveyed faculty at those institutions. So that in what was done today, which will be the First time to release the results that you are part of the course. Uh, well, if you think people are reading, yeah, they're having Because last time I presented, uh, the, uh, Kevin invited me to do a uh, symposium that they do at the University of North Texas, and I released the results for the first time from the study, and I thought he was going to be in the crowd again today. And <laughs> once again, witnessed the first piece of some results from the survey part of So we went back and said, we're going to be serving people at these institutions. What I present today will be 
to some of those first findings of the, some of the questions that, that we asked them. And the next stage of that is actually to link the responses with the survey with the actual documents. And that, that's still that's still coming. Um, and so we asked faculty member, what are the what do you think is important when considering where to submit your work? So I'm trying to understand, okay, well, why are you not submitting? Why is you're not putting and this is the previous study that I've kind of asked this question before, right? And it's always come out in any of those other studies that open access is not very high on the list. So what is high on the list is like it has the leadership that I would like to see. Okay, so that's okay. Uh, it has things like well, the overall prestige of the venue. Uh, it's a venue that we regularly read, uh, and uh, the impact factor of the journal is up there. And you do get, you know, that the publication of my article is freely available to the public. So these are sort of sorted in the, the, the dark blue is the strongly agreed, and then it goes from strongly agreed to disagree to neutral, strongly disagree. And so you see that uh, making it publicly available is not so high. But then what we did was slightly different than some of these other surveys that have done, and then we asked them the question, what do you think your peers think is important when submitting publications? And here again, I don't want to get into, we don't need to go through over all of these numbers and details, but first you see that uh, the, the publication is really available to the public, yeah, it drops down a notch, and overall prestige of the venue climbs up a lot. And so what we did is just so that you don't have to try to remember the two graphs in the head, the uh, statistics for you and uh, highlighting the things that it's not the reason it's not these are things where there's big differences in the questions, right? So it's not that it's, you know, I don't, it's not me really. I care about the public, and I care about the readership, but you, my peers, you care a lot about money and prestige. So we marked and read the things that are like uh, the answers where there's statistical significant uh, difference where. I look better, right? So, as a readership I want to read, I answer that I think that's more important than my peers. Uh, the publication is clearly available to the public, again, I think that's more important, even though they're low on the list, but we want to sort of do that comparison. I think it's more important than my peers. But my peers think that the impact factor is more important than I. I don't care about the impact factor, they care about the impact factor. And how often the journal appears to be cited, so just another just to get a metric citation, again, my peers think that's more important than I do. Uh, and uh, to merit pay, or like that I receive direct financial support, like basically that I'm going to be rewarded for that publication. My peers are driven by that money and citations and prestige. I'm driven by wanting to have, at least relative to my peers, right, I'm driven a lot more by making sure I have the leadership I want and making sure that my uh, scholarship is available to the public. So this is where we're, we're starting to get. This is why, uh, getting back to the title of the original sort of question around, like, uh, there is uh, around why are our faculty the key or not? We're going to keep coming back. So we start thinking about our relationship with each other and how we think about these things. It starts to get a little bit, uh, the, the picture starts getting a little bit messy as soon as we start sort of trying to understand not just individual attitudes. But how people think about the system as a whole and how people think about their place in life. We asked a similar sort of question around like, what do you think is valid in the RBT process? This is a different way of trying to get at a very similar question, right? It's around it's not just what when my peers are thinking about publishing, they might think about some things, but what do you think that the committee that's going to evaluate you is going to think? And again, in here what we get at the top is the total number of publications, the number of publications per year, the name recognition of the journal, the impact factor of the journal are the four most things that people think is going to be valid. So again, you do have an effect here of people feeling like they are going to be judged at the time when, when it comes down to the evaluation by these things. And public availability of the journal, again, is like in two last blog posts or other kind of sort of uh, public outreach where it's pretty low to the bottom, free print pretty low to the bottom. Um, other kind of sort of book chapters or other kind of things, all those like the traditional publications are kind of in the middle. So again, we're starting to get this on how we judge better. So let me sort of summarize here. Uh, for faculty members, I think when we look at our values, right, so they're well aligned with some of the principles of open, right? We are. We have these. These. When we ask the questions around open access, when we ask these questions around, like, do you want? Do you think it's important to be? Uh, is publicness important? We see it mentioned in the documents. We see it talked about in uh, in all of the uh, in all of the um, in the things that are going to be used to 
which are their work. When you ask people questions about it, they mention that these things are going to be something that is that that to them is important relative to the case. Uh, but we still are not explicitly validating it because we're not including it in these documents as saying, yes, if you make your work open access, you will be rewarded in some way. So the values are there, we signal to them, we have them in place, but we don't necessarily uh, explicitly validate them. So what happens, and this is sort of where the, the conclusion that I'm coming to is that we are sort of moving forward with this project, is that because we have this misalignment between what we think and what our peers think. Because we're not explicitly valuing, we fall back on the, these metrics and the prestige, assuming that this is what the other people are doing. So we are sort of left in not making it explicit. We're sort of left to fall back on whatever the system has traditionally been doing and continue to replicate that narrative around the traditional venue, the prestige, the citation metrics. But in short, I think that this is the lesson that I've learned about faculty is that we're super inconsistent. We talk about these things in very in ways that I think we would all find very agreeable, right? When you ask like this, people are not opposed to the idea of this notion that we just need to go around espousing all of those things I led in the presentation with, right? That we need to just go around and tell people about why it's so important, why it's the ethical and the right thing to do. How we're going to be helping to break the knowledge divide, and all of those things are like things that faculty members don't necessarily oppose. Like they're not in opposition to. It's not a matter of convincing them, but we do need to understand this inconsistency of that, that we have this internal conflict that we're trying to uh, I think uh, the conclusion that I'm coming to is that it's not about and this is, like, it's not about just going around convincing faculty members that this is the right thing. What we need to do is actually come back and address it. and how better have that default that we fall back to be something that that's right. Because it's those it's what's what's underlying all of these things is like it's a system that people need to fall back on whatever is going on around them. And those options are second not to spark. Right, then we need to fall back to set that, that default position, that fallback position of like when my values are going in the right direction, but the, um, but the system is pushing me in another. If that fallback position is one that is aligned with our uh, open or, or the kind of scholarship that we want to see, then that's what faculty members This is where the role, I think, of those that are working within institutions uh, in not in, like in the research capacity, you need to work at setting that underlying default position in a way. It's not necessarily tackling the point of research you're thinking, but rather tackling the system that they're, they're brought into. Because so I think we need to acknowledge that it's not just also any kind of, like, so this is again like, yes, setting the default to open, but the other setting going to the conversation that you're going to be having over the next few days is that we don't, uh, we need to acknowledge that not open alone. It's not enough. It needs to be a very purposeful kind of kind of open, and it needs to be guided in a particular way. Uh, and so here, as I think, as I'm going to sort of need to start thinking about what it is that you're going to be sort of in discussions and the breakout rooms, and that you're going to be talking about these things, is around how is it that we can sort of tackle this challenge of addressing what is the this underlying system that the researchers are, are on. I want to talk a little bit about some of these are sort of the themes that I'm going to share with you for my hopefully coming in and coming up to this part. Um, the, the different sort of themes that this is something I'm going to share, sort of like some of the things that you're going to be discussing in the next little bit. So I want to leave you sort of with some of these, uh, thinking about how some of the lessons I think that we're learning from studying consensus, studying digital culture, can, uh, can apply to these different areas. The first one around policies, right? Here it's like where we start thinking around the role that institutional mandates uh, play in policies are, uh, <coughs> that have come around in very many different ways, right? You start seeing them a lot around funders, you have things like the open funders research group, open research fund, I can never get through it. <laughs> open research funders group. Uh, uh, and also policies. I mean, like SFU, we did uh, open access policy some years back, led by the library. It's all kinds of ways that we can try to fit in open access policies later on. Wherever. 
And I think when you look actually in there's, there's some nice studies looking at over the compliance with these mandated policies and show that actually in Canada with the policies and the mandates don't actually work very well. In other parts of the US and in the UK, they actually have been much more effective. But I'll argue for the policies that we have in place, even though people don't spread. If, again, here's one of those things that when you spread about incentives come down to policies, people think it's the reward system of, of the policy that's putting it in place that's going to get people to act. I'll argue that, given what we're learning from the incentives, is that but the most important thing that the policy can do is signal to researchers that other researchers are caring about it. There's, we need to expose what it is that others are thinking and what it is that others are valuing just as much as we need to actually create explicit incentives for the individual. Because we're finding that gap there between what I think, what I would like to do if I was just given the opportunity, but if my peers would just be a little more generous in how they think about it. Right, so I think that those policies are in place. And so as you think and discuss issues around policy, think not just of the explicit incentives that you might be able to put in place, but rather the the role of sort of signaling what is value, but it's this issue of values is another one that we'll come back to we'll come back to again. The second is around again education and here is where I think librarians and think have played a crucial role in educating around our past. I think one thing we learned by looking at some of these wording on these things is that clearly there is more to be done around getting people to actually know what open access is, to not equate open access publications with other non-traditional uh, open access writings with blogs and other such things, or to not just say an open access publishing or instant publishing of no prestige. So clearly we do have some traditional education role that still needs to be played. But again, here again, there's something for me around the role around education is not so much around uh, teaching people the specifics of how it is that we might, uh, what open access is or what its virtues are, but just signaling and looking at or teaching people what it is that others around them are already thinking about. Because I think there's a lot of The place where I have been focusing a lot of my sort of thinking and attention is a lot around the work of, uh, in, in this our communication community around the issues and conversations around network production. And here is one where I, as we go into the fishbowl of discussion, I would love to jump in and sit in the middle of it and have conversations with you all about because the issues around software and technological infrastructure related to open scholarship. For me, this is sort of, this is the, was the key sort of, what I managed to do in the institution is that I think the faculty members and them, they're not the key, but changing that infrastructure that's underneath them and work that they're trying to work with it is. And that this is a role that I get any of you who are working within, like from, from the library space, thinking around like the role that you have in shaping that infrastructure. Because if you can embed these values that the faculty member share with you around how these things that make these scholarship public is important. Uh, if you can embed those things into the infrastructure, that's going to be the fallback position that people are going to go to and that people are going to end up any part. And here we're the scholar-led infrastructure and scholar-owned and scholar-led infrastructure. To me, it's sort of a crucial piece because if we are in charge of the platform and we already share the value around making scholarship open, then those I, I still maybe it continues to be optimistic on my part, but I believe that if we were making those decisions about what the platform would look like, we would we would be doing it in such a way that it would be advancing the agenda of those ones that are <laughs> And so this is like for me, faculty are not the key. The infrastructure is the key. Of course, then we need the academic community as a whole, not just faculty, but everybody in the from administrators to staff students and faculty to be in charge of making the decisions and setting those values. And again, here are all of the discussions that are hopefully going to be happening in the next uh, in the next day around what are the, what are those values that need to be baked into those. That's where an important conversation needs to take place today. So that as we start taking more and more control of that infrastructure and start trying to like get back some of that ownership, we're doing it in a way that's tapping into the into those Share uh, around institutional workloads and operations of business around things like what happens when there isn't support for open. I'll argue that even when there isn't support explicitly for open initiatives, initiatives that are branded as open or initiatives that are like, explicitly about open access, 
that there's still tons of ways that you can be supporting open even when you're not when those things are not paid by supporting again some of those surrounding peripheral things that are around the decision making that that members are going to be following back to whenever they need to make a decision around where they're going to publish or where it is that they're going to look at an environment. So you can support it by supporting community like initiatives that again the, the, the community engaged initiatives, initiatives that have to be not with the publishing itself, but with anything that's peripheral to it, that continues to show people that there's value in that work that's being done, that has nothing necessarily to do with open access or open educational resources. That it's looking for other ways in which the values can be shown. And this is where that, I'm in the talk about that human element, this piece around what it is, what, what do these values need to look like, how do we need to think about it, Inclusion, participation, new voices, what, what this actually looks like in practice. That those discussions, again, need to be had not just in the context of open publishing or not in the context of just of openness, but just in the context of discussions that are happening in academia. So, again, we need to think about because we need to figure out how it is that we shift the underlying landscape so that whenever a decision needs to be made about where I'm going to submit, the default is going to be there. It's going to be one that's advanced. I want to thank everyone on the RPT team because it's not just me doing all of this work. Uh, and then I'll finish uh, up. So, Sarah McKiernan, right now, the research man, who are sort of the PIs on the team, and they're the research assistant that I've been working with, Carol Nunez, who's in the team, sort of fabulous for you, thinking about all of this data and helping us to piece it out. So we said issues is sort of one of those where we did as many as we sort of found, and then we probably missed some instances of certain ways people thought about metrics, but they all had to do specifically with citations. Yeah. There's no references to all metrics. Oh, so all, met so all metrics, I think, was not, we, I think we might look for it, but not, but there was no actual mention of the term all metrics. Uh, yeah, we saw that I can't recall. Yeah, then we have another publication coming out now, which is looking at all the different kinds of outputs. That we do. So we did like that one with like a million different things that people like different kinds of um, but around the yeah, the metrics was just all of them. the words that are counted in that thing is only the citation metric. And so there's other kinds of metrics that maybe are referenced in other ways that we that we haven't tried now. Oh. This is like one of those things that there's an infinite number of things that you can look for in these documents and like, we sort of just made a calculation around look at the citation. I think there's no actual we did absorb all metric and it's not there anywhere in the document. Thanks for your sharing your It's really interesting. When I think of the scholar of communication environment, there's the journals that people are choosing to publish in all of these things you talked about. But there's this whole other environment of discoverability, all these databases, and, and whereas Google is sort of the default go to that a lot of people are using it. It doesn't have the kind of sophistication that where the science is focused is doing these really expensive databases that we buy and pay for national level. So how how does all that work that goes into 
you know, at the institution where it's classically concept called dual space. How, how does this, how does that discovery environment in the fit into this idea of, of, of what do we have to do to, to get those things open? So those are all, you know, and Google, although as I said, it's a go to, it may be my challenge is sometimes the brain. There's still a lot of scientists in their go to. So I have a couple of two things about this. One is around the issues around publication decisions. And in North America, when you ask people around the factors that are affecting the publication decisions, so we had on top of the options we presented, we had we curated from other uh, other research that's done in the same field. We asked like other factors and where it's indexed. I don't think I mean, we certainly didn't come up with a theme. I don't think we came up with any individualized. It. But it's certainly not something that's on researchers' minds around. Oh, I need to publish in this journal because it's indexed in that database, right? Maybe it comes up indirectly when people think it's a journal that right, has the leadership that I want, or people that think so it's maybe an indirect way, but not certainly not in So I, in that sense, it's not playing a role in the minds of, of research. But there are initiatives, this is part of this taking back control of Jeffrey Carter that I was referring to that I think is so important. Initiatives are trying to, for example, create an open citation index so that we can do some of these things and ourselves, not just around discovery, but also around sort of metrics. We've been doing things here around making you know, like open alternative metrics. Uh, there's folks at the initiative for open citations that are trying to again grab the open citation data that's available so we can create an open citation index so that you can do these kinds of things. It, it's essentially it's all part of the ecosystem, and it's part of the ecosystem that I'm sort of arguing needs to fall back to the uh, it's the fallback position, whatever that is, that is own bias needs to have these values taken. So if we value discovery, then we would, as I mean, we would try to do it in a way that, that it's actually happening, and then people that access that discovery layer are also the right audience. And there's some interesting work they've back story to you as uh, they're trying to build a tool called um, Get Research, something, something, I can't remember the name. But we are yeah, trying to build essentially a search engine that's for public use, where they are trying to basically create a search like a, a Google Scholar of just open access publications that you could give to high schools to say, search here, you'll find your publications, but only ones that you can actually. So there's efforts to do these things, but we are not necessarily doing that. Uh, it's, this is that kind of data is coming from funded by a private founder. Fund, Funding a nonprofit, so it's not necessarily academic itself. Or, or, or. Was a question. Sorry, I'm here. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, I was wondering your thoughts on the um, like, uh, knowledge mobilization of the university for, for open access like, uh, research, especially research on participants who have been. Uh, has to do with some public sort of face to it. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you think that that actually has some, that will really have some further push Yeah, I, I mean, I think it does in the sense of the, these are part of, this is what I'm saying around like the values are already there, right? So these are, this is, this is the university is amazing, right? And the people, again, people at the administration of universities are also faculty members that have now moved on to those roles, right? But this is, for me, this is the sign that. We have the right values already taken. Like we're not pushing for knowledge mobilization because like, some outside force of academia is imposing it on us. It's a self-imposed desire to make the knowledge available to the public. And so we need to figure out ways of making sure that that mode of uh, doing work is that we are acknowledging that this is shared value and that when somebody else is going to be looking at it, they're also going to be looking at it and they made a bill, and if we're embedding it into the work that the university does, then it's going to be, well, this is something that we like, this is something that is just standard done in the university, so I'm going to do this for all the And as part of that will come sharing the research. For me, those things are important in how they show and they signal the values that are all around. You don't need to change mind about openness. We just need to make it easier for people. In the local journal research on you know, why faculty are 
what they thought about choosing their journal and what they thought their peers were thinking about looking at their publications. When I talk back to the number one thing that concerns you is how many citations that might get into their journal. Maybe that's just taken simply in your, I want to get the readership I'm interested in, but the fact that I see they're not interested in readers, they're interested in citers. And they are interested. Yeah, they're, they're interested, interested in citing. So what's the problem right now? Yeah. They're interested in citing is because they think that that's what they're evaluating. Like they think this is what their peers think. Right? But that's not that's not true. Your research said that they, they thought that their peers were concerned with how many citations the journals were getting, so high, how highly ranked the journals were. But it sounds like they did not say my peers are interested in how many cites. Yeah, but they, yeah, when we ask when we ask the question, what do you think you're going to be about it? So, it, so we have yeah, they answer the question, where are you choosing? Because the question was the, the one that I did the first is around where how are you choosing to publish? Mm -hmm. When you ask the question around where what do you think is getting valued in your, in your promotion process, then uh, total number of publications and, and but yeah, they back back on the same my total number of sites did not come up, and I'm yeah. interested in, in why you think that is. Because as I say, uh, from my anecdotal experience, how many uh, how many people cited my work? How many people found my new research based on my research? Yeah, I think people are are more concerned about the venue and the, the name recognition of the journal than they are about the individual number of citations. Because it becomes a process of those things. The cycles of evaluation are often such that you you don't have the citations accumulated by at the time that you're being and given how clear it is that they're, they're however you want to talk about quality and whether you can to measure the quality, they're interested in quality. Uh, if we put a statement about open access into every uh, review process in the country, are there enough high quality open access journals out there to help if, they, if they're looking for quality? <coughs> Is it simply a problem that they're they're steering toward you know the high name recognition, yeah. or would the qualities of an access journal simply not exist for them? And therefore, is your promotion of open access is that a chicken and egg question? Let us get it into every policy, and then the journals will emerge. And so we asked one of the questions that is another one that we've got sort of in the pipeline. One of the questions we asked people to define some of these terms, and we asked them to define the word quality, impact, prestige, and open access. My favorite definition of open access, by the way, was somebody said, if I post it on Facebook, my mom can read it. <laughs> that's what I just like. If you ever want it, like, it's sort of just like such a, so succinct, I mean, it focuses very clearly on the public access, but it's like, that was, that, that was the entire definition. If I post it on Facebook, my mom can read it. Uh, but when we ask them about definitions of quality, the thing that comes up with peer review as the most, like, by far, like, this is how people are defining quality. It has nothing to do with the, Business model being used or the access model being used by, by the journal. And so I think that this is what people are looking for is some validation that somebody else is doing that for work and this is how they're defining quality. Are there sufficient open access journals that go through a peer review process? I think that. Well, are there sufficient open access journals to compete with nature? Because that's, that's what you're saying. So, sorry, if someone's looking for quality, they're looking to publish in the very best journal that they did, the one that's going to get the most recognition that they possibly can. So as I say, and uh, if you're again, you're coming, this is and this is where the crux of this discussion sort of goes around that the, the, the com, confusing the discussion around like the prestige and the recognition with the conversation about quality. Which when you look at like these things are very different. When you look at actual some uh, elements of, that are normally associated with high quality around like sample sizes or around retraction, that the impact, like, the impact of the journal is often not, it's not at all correlated with some of these measures of quality that you might say that's a rigorous study that was well done. Uh, but when you look at, um, but there's journals that just undergo a peer review process whether it's new open access or not, those are the things that I think have that the more quality. But people confound these things all the time. When you ask them for the definition, this is what they, what they make sense. So this is, again, for me, there is uh, there's a question where people value this openness, but we need to allow there to be options for them to go to and signal to them that there's going to be some value that their peers are going to actually recognize that. Yeah. I'm interested in what makes the show up in your results there and has to do with the top of preprints, which 
ranking pretty low looking in terms of faculty looking at nothing. And yet we know in terms of opens, all of the infrastructure has been an explosion of frequent services in the last few years in particular. Um, we understand that these things don't have peer review applied to them as we could, but also the study that was done in the archive a year or so ago that showed high flow through rate of things that started the archive into um, accredited to journals and um, and that there really aren't a lot of changes actually in the works that are first and positive to what shows up. So my question really is whether you see that as important different servers and similar services as an important component of open infrastructure, or do you think like the results suggested that that just has to be called on as a component of a faculty So what are your thoughts on that? So it's a perfect example of the kind of thing that I'm saying is like we as soon as we create an infrastructure to be in place, right? And we create a norm around this is like a thing that is done, and you can just share your research in these places, and people will just default to doing that, whether it's valued or not. The fact that it comes out low in the ranking, when we looked at we actually in the paper that we got coming out on output, we looked at you know different kinds of the traditional publications like the and we looked at all these sort of uh, different kinds of venue like public media, like you know, arts and performances, and preprint as actually as a, as its own item, it's only it's mentioned I think in eight percent or something. Right? So it's really not valuable. But yet we had this explosion of a change in practice because we created infrastructure. So here's this thing where you can create the infrastructure and change what it is that is an option that's just available to present. And then people can say, well I do want to share my work. And if journals, I mean, it's not going to prevent me from submitting to that type of teach journal later, I can just do that, sure, and people will do it. And so for me, the, the, the rise in the adoption of treatment is a perfect example of what it is I'm talking about. If the values are there, and if we just set, create a default option that this is just a thing that you can do because we, that, that's in place, then people will start adopting and putting their things without it ever needing to be explicitly valued in the RPD process. Because we've seen that that drive hasn't been accompanied by evaluation of these things as a scholar as an incentive. So it shows that we don't need to have an incentive for those things to be it's beyond it's just tapping into that underlying desire to share your work. First of all, thank you very much. It's interesting the results of the study that you're doing. And I, it just occurred to me like it seems like the institutions are telling us how the funders, right? So we have funders who have open ID polls, and then the institutions are lagging on the institutions for their policies related to open ID so what do you think? Why, why is it that? I'm not sure if the, the institutions are lagging behind. I think the culture lags behind in some sense, right? Like the, the, the funders are also, not, like it's not like the funders are getting this idea that open access is a good idea, like entirely on their own. Those ideas are also coming and being born from within the academia. Like I don't think that it's like, here we have all the people from outside the university. They're the ones asking us to make our research open. It's also all coming from within and then being channeled towards the, like that's shaping the decisions that are happening from the funders. And university policy, like I said, like none of the things that we got in the RPT guideline in any way prohibit you from doing open access. And they don't punish doing open access either. They, they might not be explicitly rewarding it, but it's certainly within the allowable list of the list of things that are neither inclusive nor exclusive. The <laughs> open access things are there like, and they count. Right, so they start with bias, but this is, a, this is yeah. They, but, I, but I think it's lacking is not the institutions as much as it is the culture around making these things go there. The, for me, that's that's where I see the the gap is in changing what it is that we understand is going to my peers are going to recognize when I be. Because I think the institutions also there's tons. How many how many of your institutions have an open access policy? Yeah, there's like, they're, they're, and how, like, how many of you have an like, institutional repository? Everybody has Exactly. <laughs> right? So, like, the things are there. The institutions put these things in place. And, like, I bet you that you're, if you look at the mission statement of your university, 
a better way to reach the public in some way. I wish you could look at the, the, the review center promoting like, the, the, the policy, like right? they talk about like the public mission of the university in some way. Like those things are kind of there in the policy that are allowed and things, but the culture of making them happen is not there. In some cases, because the infrastructure is not in place to update it. Okay, time for one more question. Okay, thank you. So I have a question uh, regarding the question I was doing. Uh, I was reading an article recently and they were uh, discussing about the impact of China on Australia, increasing citation of uh, um, articles demonstrated there, and then they were able to show that the demonstration of what the China was doing actually increased uh, usage, but not necessarily the citation. And then some faculty have been discussing about why we didn't really care about the person that was in China, because we don't really see the value of using the person. If they have put their work open as a journal, why should they put it in China? So what, what is, how is it possible to, you know, what kind of cultural activities would it require for them to start saying this value in China? And we're asking, can you really show the proof that China was free, increase or decrease uh, uh, citation of uh, journals or articles? So, what is it? Is it like you said that like the culture, is it a cultural problem or is it is an institutional deficit? I think once the work is publicly available, I mean, I have some analysis, but I know I'm going to insert them very much. I have nowhere to hide the answer to this question. But I often, yeah, that I often don't, uh, like, I, when I deposit in a central repository, sometimes I, it, like, I'm doing it because I would like to support the institutional repository of the university. When I publish in an open access journal, it's like the work is there and available, and I don't, I don't necessarily, like, feel the need to do so either. So this is, I think a question for a researcher is like, what what am I gaining from doing this? I think it's a legitimate question around like, why is it that I would want to do this? So I think that it would, would to get if that's important, then there needs to be a demonstrated value of what it is that that's there, or, or I need to be able to see that as I as I'm doing it, that I see that this is the cultural norm in my And so to do that, so that needs to be some exposing of what's the underlying value, not just the underlying. Value for me, but like, what what is the motivate? Why am I motivated to do so? Because I'm increasing. If it's about giving accessibility, it's about the preservation, it's about whatever it is that that is the compelling reason why you think this social posture is important. People need to like need to expose that conversation so that we understand that this is something that we all might need to do. So we need to change that practice that so that it becomes something that we. You know, that's something worth supporting. Because I don't, I do think that if it was about like, oh, I'm going to give access to other people, again, researchers are already involved with the, with the idea. So it's about making, changing what it is that everyone around us is. On that note, can I get a round of applause for one? When you come back, we will be tackling the fishbowl. That's why we didn't just mess with the chairs. We will be doing a fishbowl. And so heat up and get your energy because we're going to start diving into some good stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs>